Good evening and welcome to the centenary series of lectures brought to you by the Society for Army Historical Research. I'm Ewan Carmichael, Chair of the Society. I'm delighted that members of the Society can join us from all four corners of the United Kingdom. On behalf of Council members, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Friends of the National Army Museum. And if you're tuning in from around the world, but particularly from the Commonwealth, it's great to have you along. Thank you to all of our speakers and panel members who have made this series possible. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third of our talks to mark the Society's centenary. My name is Andrew Cormack, and I'm the editor of the journal. Juliet Pattinson is Professor of Modern History and Deputy Director of the Division of Arts and Humanities at the University of Kent. She has published widely on the socio-cultural aspects of both the First and the Second World Wars, including work on the Special, Special Operations Executive and the French Resistance but also on the role of women, most notably the first aid nursing yeomanry during the First World War. Her talk tonight addresses the attitudes of men who were in reserved occupations and who were therefore legally prevented from joining the services. Drawn largely from testimony recorded through oral history projects, she reflects upon the false impression that wartime Britain was almost entirely populated by newly empowered women who were required in industry and in the forces and by children and the aged or disabled. She examines the regrets of those who were encapsulated by Dr Johnson's phrase Every man thinks meanly of himself for not having been a soldier, because they were not able to be soldiers. But she also cites the other side of the story, men who, although not pacifists or conscientious objectors, did not wish to join the military, and a third group which considered that their civilian work was just as important as fighting and that it made a real contribution to the war effort. This is an interesting reflection on a neglected part of the social history of the Second World War and neatly analyses the expectations, hopes and requirements of society, individuals and the state in the conduct of world war. Hello, my name is Juliet Pattinson from the University of Kent and um, I was delighted to be invited to, by the Society for Army Historical Research to talk about an area of my interest. Um, and I think my work fits in within this kind of new military history. I'm a social and cultural historian, a gender historian, an oral historian. Um, so I don't look at particular battles or particular regiments. Um, what I'm really interested in is using a really rich array of sources such as personal testimonies, um, in particular oral histories, memoirs, um, diaries and, and letters, as well as things like mass observation, film, posters, advertisements, um, to think about the experience of war um, for men and women. Um, I've published extensively on secret agents, SUE agents, who worked, um, uh, operated in occupied France uh, during the Second World War. Uh, I've also recently published a book on the first aid nursing yeomanry, this kind of elite group of women who navigated their own way uh, to Belgium and France um, and kind of set up hospitals with very little training um, and drove ambulances. Um, and I also published a book along with Arthur McIver and Lindsay Robb, and this is the talk today, um, on men in reserved occupations. 
so men who were prevented by the state from going into uniform and I think that kind of um, outsider perspective I hope will be of interest to you um, because it kind of gets us to think about what it was about service um, in the military force forces that was so appealing to men and if we kind of look at the experiences of men who are prevented from doing that what does that say how does that impact upon men and their sense of self so i hope you enjoy it um, and i look forward to meeting you i hope at some point in the future thank you in spite of the wartime rhetoric of a people's war in which everyone had a role to play the categorisation of individuals as either civilians or combatants during the Second World War remained paramount. As Graham Dawson notes, the civilian military distinction has taken the form of an especially acute separate spheres. If active service distinguished between men and women, and if manliness and heroism were embodied by the soldier hero, a term which refers to an idolised yet largely imagined conceptualisation of British masculinity as discussed by Dawson, what then becomes of the man who remained a civilian? The consensus among social historians such as Penny Summerfield, Lois Bibbins and Nicoletta Gallacci appears to be that civilian men in both world wars were emasculated by women's wartime roles, their newly acquired skills, increased affluence, greater mobility and heightened sense of self-worth and they were compared unfavourably to the uniformed soldier. Caught in a no man's land between female war workers and male competents, it is argued that men on the home front experienced a reduced sense of importance. As Penny Summerfield has noted, popular perceptions of men on the home front was that their masculinity was in deficit and that they were in some way impaired and by wartime standards emasculated. So were men who served on the home front, who were prohibited by the state from getting into the army during the Second World War, second class subordinate men in reserve? And how did they respond to being prevented from going into the army? What I want to do in this paper is to adopt a socio-cultural and a gendered approach to prompt a re-evaluation of what service in the British Army meant to the men who were excluded from accessing the prestige and status of being soldier heroes. Now the men who served in the Second World War were part of a generation brought up in the wake of the First World War. This modern form of industrialised warfare is considered by some scholars to have had an emasculating effect it wrought havoc on men's bodies with bullets blasting and shrapnel shredding the long-held belief in physical perfection as a marker of ideal masculinity. And emotionally incapacitated men whose nerves were unravelled by shell shock, mental breakdown and neuroses. While the notion of what it meant to be a man was under extreme pressure, the soldier hero as a masculine ideal survived the First World War intact. Conceptualisation of the dead as the lost generation and the finest flower of manhood bolstered further the hegemonic status of the soldier. One of the men I interviewed for a project about the Jedburs, these were men who volunteered for special and highly dangerous duties, he was born in 1923 and he recalled the poems he was able to recite as a teenager. The Charge of the Light Brigade, The Last Fight of the Revenge, The Private of the Buffs, The Red Thread of Honour. Grenville's Into Battle and Hodgson's Before Action and he told me learn those poems and you will probably want to be a soldier yourself. These poems provided him with a clear model of what a young man should aspire to be in order to become manly. This is what I was born for, he asserted. Such poetry imbued him with a highly romanticised view of war. His heroic image of war was undiluted, if not actually encouraged and nurtured by the everyday masculine culture of the interwar years. Over 400 plays and novels, many of which celebrated camaraderie and adventure were published in the interwar period, imbuing another generation with a highly romantic notion of war. So this interviewee, Glenn Loosemore, reflected, without it being in any way militaristic, I think boys read stories about the war, which conditioned them to think that serving in the forces was the common lot of young men. Lots of boys soaked themselves in this. Furthermore, cheap and readily uh, circulated papers such as Modern Boy, Adventure and Rover were likely to be the chosen reading material of teenage boys of all classes in the interwar period. And this was a time before comics had been devised and when childhood literacy levels were high. 
In her analysis of nearly a century of such publications, Kelly Boyd concludes that there was more fighting, bleeding and brutality featuring in the pages of interwar story papers than ever before. These stories, which were a central part of Boyd's fantasy life, fueling their imaginations, were, to quote Dawson, windows into the ideologies of masculinity that were circulating at this time. Illustrated histories were another aspect of the masculine pleasure culture of war and were a key site for inculcating idolised notions of mas martial masculinity, facilitating boys' negotiation into manhood. While it's impossible to be exact about the impact of models of desirable masculine behaviour that were disseminated in popular literature and consumed by youth in this period, given that they could be read at a purely superficial level, and while they did not necessarily determine behaviour, it can be asserted that they shaped views and values of a generation of eager young men keen to flex their patriotic muscles. These war stories and poems fueled teenage boys' inner or psychic desires, and as Graham Dawson asserts, provided shared forms of fantasy and play through which their own masculinity could be imaginatively secured. Many young men raised on this literature were eager to serve in the forces when conflict erupted again. Yet, not all were able to, and were prevented from fulfilling their fantasies from boyhood of soldierly adventure. Many men who were in good health and age within the call-up range were prohibited from undertaking military service. Indeed, in 1945, when membership of the services was at its highest, the proportion of men engaged in civilian men, uh, over 10 million, to men in the services, 4.6 million, was approximately 2 to 1. Statistically, far more men remained stationed on the home front, working either in heavy industries, such as shipbuilding and coal mining, or in white-collar occupations, such as the civil service and the medical profession, than were conscripted into the three armed forces. This was because the British war effort needed not only soldiers to fire weapons, but also civilians to make munitions, build ships, grow food, and maintain a basic level of services on the home front. In the lead up to the outbreak of the war, the British government had begun to organise and prepare for military conscription and the parallel control of its manpower resources. The fit young man was the target of conscription to the military services, and so to be eligible for the armed forces, a man had to be aged between 19 and 41, be physically fit and not be employed in an occupation considered essential to the prosecution of the war. Skilled male workers employed in a wide range of jobs whose expertise were required on the home front were prevented from being absorbed into the forces. These skilled roles were listed in a schedule of reserved occupations. There was a mixture of white collar professional occupations such as pathologist and schoolmaster and university lecturer. Lower middle class jobs including spectacle frame maker and French polisher and heavy industry trades such as foundry worker and dock worker. Occupations were listed alphabetically, from accountant, as we see here, right the way through to zinc manufacturer. In total, there were almost 2,500 individual roles mentioned on the schedule. The vast majority of listed occupations were related to industry, and it was engineering that was the single, single largest field employing men throughout the war. As we can see here, a number printed next to a particular occupation referred to the age at which the worker became reserved. So the lower the occupation's age of reservation, the more important the role. Lighthouse keeper was reserved at 18, postman at 35. So postmen under the age of 35 would be called up and those above were reserved, prevented by the state from serving in the forces. Reservation was on a block system, so men were automatically reserved en masse if they belonged to particular occupational groups, if they were of or above a specific age, irrespective of the exact work on which they're engaged. The schedule was not static and was subject to constant revision. There was a change from block reservation to individual deferment of key men, and the occupational criteria for reservation status was continually refined, and some occupations were entirely removed from the schedule, such as gardener, and other occupations were added as the war unfolded, such as refuse collectors. And the ages of reservation were frequently increased, de-reserving men and releasing them for the services. By 1942, the schedule was dispensed with altogether, as local tribunals made decisions about reserved individuals. <laughs> 
As the age and occupational criteria were continually adjusted and new procedures were frequently implemented, the process of reservation was, to many, unclear and uh, confusing. Following its distribution, criticisms were voiced about the surplus of reserved men in occupations that ought not be exempt and who were perceived to be evading their duty. One MP noted that the list of reserved occupations is looked upon in a good many places rather as a joke. And another said, is the right honourable gentleman aware that an expert rhododendron grower has been refused to be allowed to enlist because he's in a reserved occupation? More provocatively, uh, the statement made in March 1941 by Conservative MP and Army officer John Profumo. There are still in this country great numbers of men who ought to join up. Young men like myself, capable, fit, with the muscle but without the will. Men who are hiding behind the cloak of what are called reserved occupations. I could lay my hands on many such men, although I prefer to lay my feet on them. I could give an example, such as the man who calls himself a specialised ladies corset cutter. Is it more important for us to lace up our female sex than to lace the enemy? Up and down the country there are men who should be joining the colours before we make all our women into soldiers, sailors and airmen. Let us rout out these people and put them into the forces. So inflammatory statements such as this, inciting violence towards men who were not in uniform, made patently clear that the civilian male faced a continual struggle to establish that he was legitimately not in service uniform. As the Profumo quote makes evident, there was a hierarchy of value attached to different forms of contributions, with combatants being most commonly situated at the top. Uh, and Martin Francis's engaging study examining how RAF aircrew were represented in popular culture, both during the war and since, notes that popular memory focuses on the heroism and glamour associated with the flyboys. So these chivalric knights of the air, we might regard those as being the pinnacle of that hierarchy, embodying manly heroism, the few to whom so many owed so much. J.B. Priestley, in his influential 1940 radio broadcast Postscripts, often lauded the heroic figure of the flyer. Our airmen have already found a shining place forever in the world's imagination, becoming one of those bands of young heroes, creating a saga that men can never forget. Reserve men, in contrast, were not as prevalent in Priestley's heroes, uh, sorry, in Priestley's vignette of daily life with just vague allusions made to ploughman and parson, shepherd and clerk, and to electric welders and shop blasters who had turned tame the giants of machinery they worked with in war factories which vibrated with power. They were also missing from the many wartime propaganda posters, scrutiny of which reveals the high status enjoyed by men in the army, air force and navy, and by contrast, the fragile positioning of the male civilian. The poster series, The Attack Begins in the Factory, launched during the North African campaign, um, attempted to emphasise the importance to the war effort of those on the home front. And yet the figure of the civilian worker, male or female, is entirely absent. Instead, the posters depict muscular servicemen engaged in battle. It depicts machinery, it depicts a defeated enemy in a devastated German city. The text beneath the colourful action illustrations praising civilian workers are in such small font that they'd be easily overlooked. While the attack might have begun in the factory with the manufacture of weapons and machinery, it was rugged servicemen who played the active role in the offensive and who were visible in the poster. And this was not the only series to make invisible uh, the civilian worker. We've also got backed them up. Wartime films also underscored the supportive silent role of civilian men to service personnel. So the highly acclaimed in which we serve from 1942, serving Noel Coward, is one such example. This is the story of a ship, we're told, and the opening scene set before the outbreak of the war features shipbuilders riveting and welding as they construct the vessel. It lasts for only 90 seconds, there's no, there's no dialogue. It's just the natural sounds of industry accompanied by rousing music. And then the film moves on to focus on the Royal Navy personnel. And even wartime films set on the home front erase the young civilian man of conscription age from the screen, focusing instead on male military personnel, women and older men. Similarly, BBC radio, newsreel companies and newspapers generally ignored the man engaged on the home front in a civilian occupation. These cultural sources provide a really useful insight into some of the prevalent attitudes towards male civilian workers who spent the war working on the home front rather than serving in uniform. 
So a gulf begins to emerge then between the young, fit, brawny, heroic serviceman and the old, unfit, soft civilian. And we can recover the voices of the men who themselves were prevented by the state from going into uniform. Along with Arthur uh, McIver and Lindsay Robb, I conducted a project in which we accessed archival interviews, as well as recorded interviews with 56 men uh, who during the war were deployed in reserved occupations. Our only female interviewee, Janet Miller, a trainee teacher during the war, said, there were no men. The men were all in the forces. College was manless. There are a few, I think, who are maybe medically unfit, only two or three, but it was a time of man scarcity. The man who was not defending his country on the battlefield uh, or at sea or in the air was invisible and by implication less of a man, too old, too young or physically unfit. So some forms of maleness are then positioned hierarchically above other marginalised and subordinated masculinities. R. W. Connell's concept of hegemonic masculinity is relevant here in that it suggests that in any given culture, one form of masculinity is culturally exalted, albeit never numerically dominant, and occupies the hegemonic position. To be manly in wartime is to be a combatant. Many historians point to the primacy of military masculine identity embodied by the soldier hero within popular discourse. So Sonia Rose, for example, argues that the successful enactment of hegemonic uh, masculinity depended on being visibly a member of the fighting forces. So military uniform is this visual symbol of that elevated status and it connoted far more than military service. It's an external emblem of the wearer's fulfilment of their patriotic masculinity. It's therefore unsurprising that many men who are prevented from joining the services because of the intrinsic value of their occupations to the war effort were keen to escape their reserve status, enrol in the military, don uniform and serve overseas. Sid Archer worked as an engineer in Gainsborough's agricultural machinery manufacturers Marshall, Sons and Co during the war. Sixty years later he was interviewed by BBC Lincolnshire for the British Library's Millennium Memory Bank an initiative to record the testimonies of ordinary people on the eve of the new century. Towards the end of the interview, he reflected, entirely unprompted, upon his wartime experiences. One of my regrets is that I was in a reserved occupation. I would like to have gone and fought a bit. I would have liked to have been in one of the forces, preferably the Air Force. I would like to have done that, but there was never a chance. We were told we were building midget submarines and it did a lot of good, but it didn't seem the same. I had a lot of friends I lost, a lot of lads went and I didn't. It did seem, I often feel it, I say even my wife was in the forces and I wasn't. A lingering disappointment in Archer's life was not fighting in the Second World War. Despite his acknowledgement that close acquaintances who were conscripted into the services were killed, he wished he too had been able to enlist, repeating three times that he would have liked to. This all the more keenly felt because he perceived himself to be in the minority. In addition to his friends, even his future wife served in the forces while he was denied the opportunity by a government that considered he was of more use continuing in his trade, thus making his separation from military service even more acute. Yet to Archer, constructing midget submarines didn't seem the same as fighting. And he's not alone in expressing a sense of regret um, over his wartime experience. Ron Spedding, who started in a railway wagon works in, in uh, Durham in 1940, aged 16, tried unsuccessfully to enlist uh, with the RAF. He recollected in a kind of um, unpublished memoir, as very young men, we had actually looked forward to the day when we could join the armed forces and do our bit for king and country. We would often imagine and fancy ourselves in a military uniform parading behind a brass band and sporting medals received for courage and valour. We really did believe that the most important thing in life was to fight and destroy the enemy win the war and earn a share in the final victory and the glory. I remember feeling peeved and also a little guilty when some of my friends joyously told me they'd been released and were off to join the Air Force. And of the 56 men interviewed for my project, along with uh, Arthur McIver and, and uh, Lindsay Robb, um, 28 attempted to enlist in the military, only four of whom were successful uh, ultimately and a further two joined the Merchant Navy. So military service was evidently a powerful lure to young men. Wartime policeman John Cresswell was very explicit about his desire to do more in his 2005 interview with the Imperial War Museum. He described how he and his colleagues decided to enlist. 
we got together to make ready to go to in the forces. We just decided that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to play our bit. Oh yes, we discussed it and there we were, young, fit men doing our bit, I know in a civilian capacity, but we wanted to do more than that and we wanted to join the forces. With his senior officer's permission, Cresswell was ultimately accepted again into the RAF as a pilot and saw active service in the Far East. His emphasis on their youth and fitness made them suitable uh, for military service mirrors that contemporaneous perceptions that civilian men left on the home front were somehow impaired, either mentally or physically, and therefore not up to the task of enlisting. Moreover, this emphasis on doing more by joining the forces, with its concomitant connotation of civilian men doing less, clearly shows there was a perceived hierarchy of masculine roles during the Second World War, in which military service was positioned securely at the top. For many of our young interviewees, attitudes towards warfare had shifted little, regardless of the horrors of the First World War. Indeed, for many, there seemed to be scant recognition that doing your bit did not solely mean military service that their reserved occupation status indicated that their civilian contributions were highly prized, by the state at least, did not seem to impinge on many men's understandings of wartime contributions. For most young men, to serve and to do one's bit had purely military connotations. For many young men, the pressure to be in uniform, to be seen to want to be in uniform, was strong. For our young wartime cohort, the simple lure of the glamour of military dress was undeniably powerful. When asked why he wanted to be in the military, Frank Blinkell, a wartime apprentice draftsman in London, responded that he liked the uniform. Similarly, Jim Lister, a Carlisle railway worker, remarked, well, you're a teenager in the uniform and one thing or another, there's a lot of lads that's in it, just for the glory and whatever, the uniform. Many interviewees highlighted the uniform as a specific attraction. This was undoubtedly because young men who were not visibly identified as combatants risked public censure. The willingness of civilian men to undertake unpaid voluntary work in the Home Guard, air raid precaution and the auxiliary fire service, in addition to their full-time reserve jobs, perhaps can be explained by the fact that it enabled civilian workers to adopt a uniform, granting them access to the status that a military uniform bestowed and allowing them to retain a sense of masculinity. Indeed, Penny Summerfield and Corinna Peniston Bird, whose interviewees remembered their Home Guard uniform as a prized possession, argue that this is why some men were attracted to the organisation. It provided them with an essential signifier of martial masculinity, marking them out as a member of a military organisation that only those in the know might spot was not an army uniform. For Harry McGregor, one of our interviewees who had worked as an apprentice engineer in the Hyde Park Railway Works in wartime Glasgow, volunteering for civil defence was a route to a uniform that would impress. So he recalled that both him and his friend, who was serving in the Royal Marines, uh, went to the cinema together. I said, well, let's go in our uniform. They must have thought, you see, when you get on the tram and there's a poor soldier there, you know, made a bit of difference. You had this flash home guard. Most people wouldn't see it, just think you're in the army. So in spite of the wartime rhetoric of a people's war, in which everyone had an important part to play, the categorisation of individuals as either civilians or combatants remain paramount, with many of our interviewees wishing to be categorised as military men. For most, the pressure to be in uniform, uh, uh, or you know, again, to want to be seen to be in uniform, was really strong. The principal reason for wishing to leave their reserved occupation and join the armed forces was a pervasive feeling of being left out. The language used by men to describe this was often extremely emotive. Craig Inglis, a reserve cobbler and later Bevan boy, who was based in his hometown of Kilmarnock throughout the war, recalled his feelings that both his brothers being in uniform, and I'm not going to use um, his uh, Ayrshire accent, um, but he basically says, oh, I was proud of them. We thought they were the bee's knees, but the one that's 92, he was one of Montgomery's desert rats. The other was a bomb disposal and I was nobody. And I think that final statement is really striking. Without a military uniform, he considers himself to be a nobody, a person without interest or worth. His lack of military service clearly still rankled nearly 70 years after the war ended. Later in his interview, he spoke of being jealous of friends who were called up, and later still that envy turning to sadness. For Inglis to identify jealousy and envy, these are strong words, highly negative connotations. It shows how affected he was by his lack of military service. 
Even more candidly, Inglis admits that this coveting of his friend's military careers actually eventually turns to sorrow at the thought of the experiences he was missing. So Inglis was not alone in reacting so emotionally in recalling in the interview his wartime reservation status. When talking about their lack of military service, many of our interviewees invoked similar poignant language and indeed it was often the most animated and expressive part of their interviews. When asked how he felt about his brother being in the forces, Harold Scragg, a Tyneside mechanic, responded that the war had been a dead life. And he followed this up by stating, time just rolled over. And so to me, in that particular time, that was a dead year or two, because I think I should have been in the army. And again, that imagery, I think, is really striking. Scrag notes that time just rolled over. It was a dead period. He felt he was just marking time without making any contribution to the war. Moreover, the war made no demands on him. Frank Blinko, a wartime apprentice draftsman, similarly stated he was robbed of the experience of being in the armed forces. While Walker Leith, who was eventually released from his job as a telephone engineer to join the Royal Signals, declared that he'd been stuck around in a reserved occupation. And I think that concept of being stuck um, is a kind of recurrent narrative trope. Most men in reserved occupations were immobile. They were held statically in position in their communities while many of their contemporaries were scattered throughout the world fighting the war and even mobile women were being directed across the country to do war work. This loss of status could be keenly felt. John Hiscott, who worked as a tool maker in Plessy Company's aircraft factory in London, noted, I think I lost out a bit in sort of being streetwise, as you might say. I just worked at home and didn't leave my family and didn't go anywhere. When the lads come out of the army, I mean, you had to look after yourself, obviously, but you know, with you had to be number one and look after yourself. I found out when they came back, they were much more confident. It took me some while to get over that. As I say, I think they all came back much more sure of themselves. So Hiscott felt he'd lost out by remaining at home and the other men who had joined the forces had derived self-assurance from the knowledge of their elevated status and their more worldly experiences. And for our interviewees, the perceived loss was most obvious when they were forced to make assessments of their peers who'd gone off to fight. And such comparisons made many of our interviewees feel emasculated. It really challenged their sense of masculinity and pressured them into attempting to enlist. Yet several interviewees who attempted to enlist um, did so not out of a burning desire for the uniform or a need to face combat, but rather because they felt it was the right thing to do. They tried to enlist out of a sense of guilt and a belief in doing one's duty. So John Halloran, who worked in um, the aircraft manufacturer Napier and Sons in West London, stated, I didn't want to join the forces, but I didn't want to hide behind the job, if you know what I mean. And I was good at signalling. I was a good Morse telegrapher and I thought they might use me signalling. I didn't want to go in. Several interviewees did not yearn for military service, but they understood that they should appear to want to be in the military. This pressure to enlist was very rarely external. Very few men reported any negative comments about being out of uniform. Fred Millican, who worked as a metallurgist in an uh, engineering firm, stated, I was never sort of picked on and said, well, why are you not in the army or anything? You know, there never was any problems. Everybody just seemed to accept you were either working or you were in the forces. Nobody bothered. An engineer, Eddie Mende, stated, no, funnily enough, no, because I think people knew that everybody was in it together. Somebody was doing something somewhere along the line. While outright praise for reserve workers was rare, the experiences of our interviewees suggest that there does seem to be at least a tacit acceptance of their presence on the home front. As a cohort, they simply did not experience overt prejudice and abuse. The one exception was an interviewee from our pilot project, a Bevan boy, balloted to go down the mines upon his call up into the services. So he wasn't in a reserve occupation, um, but he was given a hen feather. Um, now that was a rare occurrence, but it was happening in sufficient numbers to be mentioned in People in Production, a 1942 mass observation publication. And these slurs aimed at civilian workers, while rare, could have extreme consequences. And a number of suicides had occurred in the wake of such incidents. Rather than being external then, the pressure to enlist came often from the men themselves. Aircraft worker Derek Sims hinted at the internalised nature of this pressure when he stated, I think the pressures in the forces side, 
it's internally built yourself you put yourself under pressure you don't really need somebody outside to get chase you about you do it you're chasing yourself about military service was evidently a powerful lure to many young men many felt they had to try to get into uniform to preserve their masculine sense of self and felt frustrated when they were prevented from doing so their youthfulness undoubtedly shaped their accounts and perhaps explains the enthusiasm of so many for wanting to join the services. Given the small number of men still alive, 70 years ago, um, that were engaged in reserved occupations, our sample was inevitably skewed towards the lower age. The youngest had been just 18 when the war ended, the oldest 28, and all but seven interviewees were single during the war, none had children. And maybe older married men, those who'd fathered children, understandably would have been more reluctant to leave their families. But even within our youthful group of interviewees, a significant number expressed absolutely no desire to enlist and were comfortable with their reserve status. And the reasons for this were diffuse. Some had an abhorrence of violence, often a knowledge um, of the realities of First World War trench warfare. Uh, others understood that their jobs were necessary, that they were providing the essential goods and services required to survive and win a protracted total war. Some were simply apathetic, happy to be sent wherever the state felt their services were best needed. Turner George Dean noted, I was happy where I was. I didn't want to be a soldier. I couldn't see any sense in it. While electrician Nick Metzen asserted, I was trying to get into munitions. So then you'd be on a reserved occupation, you see, a lot safer and a lot more money attached to it. Men's reactions to their reserve status covered a broad and complex spectrum. As Nick Metzen noted, Remaining on the home front for him did have its advantages. The Second World War inevitably brought right, wide ranging changes to working practices. Unemployment was virtually abolished. Um, the labour force swelled in size, the number of hours worked rose, wages increased, and the war created a strong demand for those with specialised skills that could be utilised in the production of goods necessary for the prosecution of modern total warfare. Thus, rather than being emasculated, by being prevented from enlisting, the men who laboured in heavy industry continued to foster a dominant mode of hard man masculinity underpinned by their capacity to garner high wages and their exposure to risk. Thus, while many reserve workers articulated a sense of being outsiders and lesser men, there were also countervailing factors in wartime which contributed to a bolstering or at least a maintenance of masculine sensibilities. And this was rooted in economic and labour market circumstances that were empowering, enabling breadwinner masculinity to be reconstructed after the depredations of the Depression. For example, the regular and fat wage packet was the outward symbol of reconstructing masculinity in wartime. Harry McGregor, who worked in wartime Glasgow as an apprentice engineer in the Hyde Park Railway Works, stated, you cut corners to get money, you know, it all meant work for money, it was all about money. And he made repeated references to higher earnings as a reserved occupation worker. I prefer to be in a reserved occupation, you know, because I think the wages were two pounds, two shillings a day or something like that in the army, you know, and because I was earning more at Hyde Park. So that was it, you know. In response to being asked if he could have joined up, even though he was in a reserved occupation, he replied, I think it could have been possible. But as I said, I was earning more money at home than if I'd been in the army. Later, he reinforced this, saying, I think most of the army thought, wish they were in a reserved occupation. Similarly, shipyard worker Charles Lamb recalled with some pride buying his first wallet and being able to save £25 in it over a year during the war. In their oral testimonies, many male war work veterans also consciously endeavoured to associate themselves with the war effort. So proximity to the means of waging war, including the production of tanks, planes and munitions, was important in the construction of masculinity among reserved workers. Recurring motifs in our interviews were Dunkirk, Spitfires and Hurricanes, Bletchley Park, Atlantic Convoys, Sicily Landings, uh, D-Day and the Mulberry Harbours. Their masculinity was bolstered through direct association with the mission of war as critical cogs in the machine of modern warfare, where victory depended as much upon producing the goods as shooting the weapons. And I think respondents found composure in that kind of narrative, which positioned them as playing an important and vital role in the war. Some men understood that they were doing their bit in civilian clothes. They were reserved because their work was vital to the war effort. Alexandra Davidson, who worked for a boat building firm in Portsmouth, stated, we didn't mind really because we were doing a job for the Admiralty. 
It was a job that had to be done during the war. It was no good having sailors if you've got nothing to sail them in, if you hadn't got any boats. So it was admiralty work we were on. We were connected very closely with the services, really. We felt we were part of the war effort. That's what it was, really. You know, same as making guns or something else. And you weren't actually firing them, but you were making them. Other interviewees were similarly keen to stress the part they and their firms had played in key wartime events. Three interviewees were at pains to stress that they'd been involved, admittedly unwittingly, in the construction of the portable temporary harbours, the Mulberry harbours, uh, using the D-Day landings. And being so closely involved in an essential part of the military war effort allowed these men to feel that they had truly contributed to victory. So while a hierarchy of value existed in wartime with the military man at the top, how civilian working men position themselves in wartime and in their interview narratives decades later range markedly across the spectrum from the frustrated heroes desperate to get into the services to a remarkable degree of comfort with their reserve work identities. Moreover, these were not necessarily mutually exclusive feelings. Young men could articulate why their civilian role was vital and still want to be in uniform. For example, William Ramage, whose heart surged upon hearing he'd been accepted to the army after many attempts to escape his reserved occupation, was also able to simultaneously show pride in his prowess as a miner. I did that for a long time. I was good at it too. It was tough, but it was very rewarding in the fact that we knew we were good at what we could do. Clearly masculinity is not this binary polarisation. Interviewees were able to select from a range of masculine identities to achieve composure. And it should not be assumed then that civilian men en masse felt emasculated. Indeed, various poster campaigns depicting brawny, muscular industrial workers endeavoured to emphasise the importance to the war effort of men on the home front, putting into visual form Churchill's um, August 1940 message that the front line runs through the factories. The workmen are soldiers with different weapons, but the same courage. This was noted by Mr Latchford, a customs and excise worker at the Swansea docks, who noted in his diary, the government is drawing a parallel between men in the services and men working on the home front. So by rescuing the reserved man uh, from obscurity, we can make working class men visible as gendered subjects. And it becomes evident that the construction of masculinity remained open to contestation. The Second World War was capable of challenging civilian masculinity while simultaneously reinforcing it by bolstering the capacity to provide and to earn high wages, both of which were key markers of masculinity. This was especially the case for the young working class hardmen who were employed in heavy industry who formed the basis of our interview sample. This classic construction of masculinity was deeply ingrained in pre-war traditional heavy industry communities. So these hard men were characterised by their breadwinner status, toughness, resilience, and their manliness was forged in physically demanding, often hazardous and unhealthy manual occupations. And by utilising our newly recorded interviews with 56 men who during the war were deployed in reserved occupations, along with archived interviews, autobiographies, archival research and visual sources, it becomes evident that there were many ways in which non-combatant men could maintain their masculine status. So to conclude, the popular memory of the British experience of war is one in which all men went off to fight and the home front was this feminised space peopled only by women, children and the elderly. And often in academic accounts, the existence of civilian men of conscription age is often noted, but given the primacy of the soldier hero, the man fighting to halt the Nazi juggernaut and liberate occupied Europe, and also you know, this near invisibility of the reserve worker uh, in both contemporary accounts, but also post-war representations, um, historians generally have concluded that civilian masculinity was challenged. And what my research with Lindsay and Arthur has sought to do is provide a more nuanced interpretation of wartime masculine status. By focusing on working class men who worked in industries classified as reserved occupations, we rescued the civilian man from obscurity, inserted him back into the narrative of Britain's war, prompting hopefully a real valuation of life on the home front during the People's War. This was no feminised space, but a world populated also by large numbers of young men. Moreover, it should not be assumed that civilian men felt emasculated by the penetration of women into areas of work previously dominated by men and threatened by the hegemonic masculinity of the combatant. A hierarchy certainly existed, and that was reflected in the narratives that positioned civilian men below that of the soldier hero. 
For many young men of military age between 1939 uh, and 45, being conscripted into the forces and donning military uniform was a means of becoming a man. This was an important stage in the construction of masculinity and the high status enjoyed by the soldier hero was celebrated on screen and in press. And indeed, half of the 56 interviewees stated that they attempted to evade their reserve status by enlisting, some repeatedly, in order to, by their understandings, contribute more directly to the war effort. This does not automatically mean that all men who were prevented from serving in the military felt inferior. Some displayed a remarkable degree of comfort with their reserved identities, having little sense of their masculinity being fundamentally challenged. And indeed, there are many ways in which non-combatant men can maintain their masculine status. An alternative site of reconstructing working class masculinity, masculine identities was the workplace and the war provided ample opportunities for the expression of provider masculinity, bringing full employment, job security, empowerment, long working hours and overtime, high wages, status and promotion. So the war for those men who remained on the home front and were prevented by the state from going into the armed forces could be experienced as empowering, enabling breadwinner masculine identities, which had been destabilised by the insecurities and job losses of the, of the depression, to once again flourish. And in these ways, this thesis of emasculation seems flawed and too sweeping. Because the Second World War strengthened masculinities in these myriad ways, it's problematic to argue that civilian men were emasculated, challenged and lacking in masculinity. Such language risks flattening out the incongruities and ambiguities of civilian working class male experience. The impact of the war on the identities of male workers was complex and sometimes contradictory. Understandably, given that it involved millions of men in an array of occupations, there's no single grand narrative of reserve status. The configurations of reserve masculinity conveyed through discursive and visual associations were often plural and ambiguous. Existing language about civilian male, um, civilian male status does not convey the ambiguity of shifting multiple and overlapping constructions of reserve masculinity. These complexities surrounding what it meant to be a man in Britain during the Second World War need expression, as it is in these inconsistencies that we see masculinity being contested. And for me, at least, it's clear that while these were reserve men, they were not men in reserve.